Hello, you two. Hello. Hi. My guests today are Stephen Vartz and Gabrielle Carcano, and they are coming to play a concert for us on Sunday, March the 27th. And they're playing a really interesting program, um, which we'll talk about. But Stephen and Gabrielle, there's something quite extraordinary about having the two of you coming to Vancouver. Maybe you know, and maybe you don't know. First of all, in about 1983-ish, I presented the person you've been studying with, Stephen. Michaela? Yes. Oh, really? I had no idea. She came to Vancouver and played a recital for us. So that's, that deals with you. Now, when it comes to Gabrielle, he studied with Andrea Lucasini, and Andrea came to us when he was 19 and played a recital. And then he came back three times. And then he didn't come for about 30 years and he came back two years ago. But not only did we have Andrea on our series, but we had Andrea's teacher, Maria Tipo. Oh, wonderful. Stephen, the last time I saw you, you were on crutches and you were at the Bullets Hall. We'd, we'd heard a wonderful uh, Schiff Bach concert. What happened to you? Um, it was a stupid accident I had uh, now three years ago, I think. At least. Yeah, at least. Yeah, I think it was about three years. Um, and I was just walking on the sidewalk when it was a very snowy day in Bonn, actually, on my way to a dress rehearsal at the Beethoven house. And I just slipped and I, I broke my leg. <gasps> Oh my God, hey? That winter. <laughs> I suppose if you had to break anything, it's lucky it was your leg and not your arm. Yeah, that's what everyone said. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so you're now living in Berlin, right? So before we talk about other important things, I see that you spent a lot of time at Kronberg Academy. Gabrielle, you've been to Marlborough and you've also been to, um, uh, it's another summer festival that you've been to many times and it's just gone out of my head now. Um, and I'm wondering what are the differences between, let's say, Kronberg and Marlborough? They're completely different concepts. I mean, Kronberg, Kronberg and the way that I am studying there is um, is a sort of a school. It's true, it's kind of um, not not exactly a school, but it's year round and you have master classes and so on, um, and lessons and uh, people even have theory lessons and things like that. And Marlboro is um, chamber music in the summer for seven weeks or so. Okay, so. Uh... So, but you do play chamber music at Kronberg, don't you? Yes, I think maybe what you're thinking about is they have always, which uh, Andre Schiff does, for example, they have always, in May, every two years, they have a very similarly modeled uh, festival to Marlboro, um, where older, older musicians like Schiff and um, uh, Tabea Zimmermann or Christian Tetzloff. Oh, were... you know, the, the lowest of the low, right? <laughs> No, the greatest people come there. It's fantastic. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, Andrush once said to me, if I would like to find young talent, uh, Kronberg is the place to go. Um, Gabrielle, there's another place you've played that absolutely fascinates me. Uh, I think you've, you're working through all the Beethoven sonatas. And that is at the Fidelio Cafe in London. Oh yeah, that also that is very special too. I mean, completely different. It's quite a it's quite a new place in London. Um, well, it's actually a, a, a cafe, a restaurant, a sort of a, a joint. I, I I don't know how to describe it, but um, it started actually a few months before the pandemic. The 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 guy is actually owned by a, by an Italian guy, uh, and and he started the place thinking about 
creating a venue uh, for classical music, you know, some more informal surround. And uh, soon, you know, after he opened, with Infancy had to shut down because of the lockdowns and everything. So it was quite tough for him. But then uh, the guy is very, is very brilliant. So he actually uh, turned the situation to his advantage because that was uh, summer uh, 2020. Uh, and there were no um, there were no concerts in London whatsoever, but restaurants were allowed to open back. So he figured that he could start a series of concerts there, and that made a big impact because um, first of all he reached out to some of the best musicians living in London. So he had his opening with Stephen Easterly playing solo and playing some Bach uh, solo in front of like thirty or forty people. And they were like after months that did no one ever heard like uh, live music, you know. So, and then it made such a big, it made such a fuss that that everyone started to reach out to want and wanted to play there, from Angela Hewitt to Victoria Mulova or I don't know, and um, and and it became some, quite of a quite of a place in London because he created this sort of formula in which there is one hour long concerts followed by a dinner. And somehow it works out really well because people go there before and they listen to music completely silently, like if it was in a concert hall. And then and you, you get to hang out with the musicians and, and there is something that really works out really well about this place. And I, I, it's hard to point out what it is, but it's, of course it's the fact that it's informal, but it's also maybe the, the, the atmosphere of the, of the room. And the fact there is this huge window just behind the musicians. So people are actually looking at the musicians and are looking at, at traffic and, and, and London, you know, moving and happening just, just there. And you can hear the noises of the street, but somehow it doesn't bother. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it was quite special for me. I was supposed to play all the sonatas in Japan and it all got canceled with the pandemic. And, and so when we talked, since we knew each other before and he was telling me about this concert that were going so well, and so we had this idea of doing something completely, uh, completely crazy, like you know, a series of a long series of concerts during a time in which nothing was really happening in a place like this. And it was really, really fantastic for me to do it. The concept, you know, I mean, first of all, I love the name of the place. Yeah. Secondly, not that I've been to many restaurants uh, in the last. Well, I started going back to restaurants until Omicron hit, and then. But every time I walk into a restaurant, I try to see where I could fit a piano <laughs> because I, I just think it's such a phenomenal idea. Um, so what kind of a piano does he have? And pr presumably it's not a big one. No, it was a, he had a Beckstein, a new Beckstein, a very, very nice one. And now he actually just bought a Stenway B, very, very nice Stenway. A D. B, B. Oh, B, B. Oh, great. Yeah, it's not a full grand, but it's it's perfect for, for the size of the room. And uh, yeah. It's not cheap by the time you add the meals. On one hand, on one hand, going out in a city like London, if you consider going out to a live show and then a dinner, probably sums up to amount the same. But uh, his idea was also to be extremely fair towards the musicians. So he pays a, a quite, quite a decent fee especially considering the UK, and that's fixed. It's not, it's not depending on whether the, 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 the venue is sold or not, if there are people or less. So he is being, being a private business. He needs to uh, pay off the musician and all his expenses and all the people working in the, in the restaurant and everything just out of the tickets he sells. He has no other you know, support. And so, but he really makes a point of doing it in a way in which is fair for musicians, which is also one of the things everyone agreed to play there because it doesn't feel like you're, you know, doing something cheap in a way. You're actually just trying to do something at your level, but just in a different situation. That's extraordinary. And so the concert happens and then when the concert's over, that's when dinner starts, right? That's right, yeah. And do people drink wine while they're listening to you? Well, they get some wine served before the concert starts and then they, they'll sip occasionally. I, don't know, I didn't really check carefully while I was playing, but for sure they have some wine. So the two of you, uh, when you build a program together, how does it work? Well, we always discuss it, obviously. 
uh, and usually there's one or two pieces that um, that I or Gabriela, usually me and the, <laughs> the past, are really passionate about during uh, this season. Um, so in this case, I think it was it was definitely the Nesku that was my idea. Yes, probably also the Schumann. I can't quite remember. Anyway, to start with um, a big piece normally. Uh, so I think we had first the Schumann and the Nesku from from my program for Vancouver. And um, and then to sort of find some other pieces that would work well, uh, both time-wise and uh, stylistically with the rest of the program. So, I mean, so you're playing uh, the Inescu, you're playing Debussy Sonata, and also Sibelius, humoresques. I mean, first of all, other than perhaps the Debussy, those, the Schumann, the Sibelius, and the Ionescu are not all that often played in violin recitals. Yeah, and it's a real shame. I mean, the Schumann, the Schumann is getting more and more played, but for years it was really neglected compared to uh, the first sonata, which we've also played and is great, but the, the second sonata is really on a different level. It's, it's a real uh, masterpiece of symphony. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a question why it was not, wasn't played so much. And the Inescu, I also believe, is really a masterpiece. And the Sibelius are also just such, a, such quirky, fun pieces that uh, they really deserve to be played. That's wonderful. And I mean, as far as I can tell, you have a hugely vast repertoire. I try, yeah. Because, um, yeah, I, I don't want to play all the things that are everyone already knows all the time. And I'm also building my repertoire, so I'm young and I want to always be learning new pieces. I, and our shift, for example, now that we mentioned him nowadays, is, says he only wants to, he's kind of limiting his repertoire now. He on, only wants to play his very favorite pieces. And I feel at my stage in my life, I'm really trying to still widen my repertoire and get to know uh, what are my favorite pieces? It's interesting that you say that about Andras because I noticed that he's playing, he's um, doing a, a Haydn festival at the Wigmore Hall. So obviously he's playing Haydn. <clears throat> and I don't think uh, of all the incredible things I've heard him play, I don't believe I've ever heard him play Haydn. Mm. So he still has room for new things as well. Yeah. Gabrielle, what about you? Do you have any um, notions about what you love to play, what you don't like to play? Oh, yeah, very much, very much. But I'm, I'm well, of course, having spent like two years with Beethoven, uh, I, I, of course, thinking about it very much. But recently I, I played, I'm playing a new uh, recital program, which I'm playing some Chopin again after many years. And that was, oh, uh, wow. that was like really like discovering it back in a way. And it probably for the first time finding that some sort of uh, personal connection or a way, a personal way of uh, approaching his music and, and, and playing it, which, which, which I never really felt before. And uh, so, I mean, it, it always changes, but, but uh, for instance, like with the, the the, the the two main pieces of our program that we were mentioning, like I played a lot of Schumann in my life, and I I, I really really wanted to play this second sonata, the second violin sonata for a very long time because there was something something I I I, I didn't have a chance to play before, and I really really loved for many years, and and that's a language I feel uh, I mean comfortable for as much as one can feel comfortable with Schumann's music, but I feel like I know. Most of his, you know, things I, I I played many things, and 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 on the other hand, Enescu for me is completely new ground. It's something that I would have not thought of playing at all, unless you know someone would have proposed me. And even then, I wasn't very uh, easily convinced. But then then I heard it live, you know, in a concert played so well, and I felt like that 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 piece, the third sonata, really was some some quite amazing amazing piece. But you know, one that's just one, that's one of the good thing about playing chamber music, especially for a pianist, because you get to discover things otherwise you wouldn't necessarily, especially in terms of repertoire. I don't think I would have ever touched an Esco note if it was just for solo piano music, you know? But this way, you have to do it. Maybe then, you know, maybe it'll work out well or less, but it's a great 
way to, to, to discover new things. Is it a big piece? It's a very big piece. I mean, for both of us, I think. I, I mean, it is for me, I guess, for, for Stephen too. Yeah. It's big, it's so rich, it's so colorful. I'm, I, I'm discovering it, and uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. Well, I must say, my favorite composer for the piano is, and always has been, Schumann, because uh, there's just such a world of emotional ups and downs and tenderness and despair and happiness and uh, I just can never get enough of Schumann. Of course. And in fact, in fact, the year that Maria Tipo came to us, uh, I can't, it's a long time ago, uh, she came and she played a concert in November and in uh, April, a few months later, Andras came and they, so Andras in those days used to give his program months in advance and he had David's Bundla Tansa on the program and of course I was just overwhelmed with joy and then closer to the concert we got Maria Tipo's program and it had David's Bundla Tansa and so I thought <laughs> and then I thought no Vancouverites have an incredible opportunity to hear two great pianists playing this piece. And why not? It's a privilege. So they both played David's Gundler Tanza. And by the way, Gabrielle, and uh, uh, Maria Tipo insisted on being paid at intermission. <laughs> And so I, uh, here I go public with this now. Uh, <laughs> and I said to her, well, you know, I'm very nervous. I don't like the notion of you leaving all that money in your dressing room. And she said, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. You, you, you come down at intermission and give me the money. So even I myself was terrified to go to the bank to get so much cash, but I did it. And I trotted down to the dressing room. It's the same dressing rooms that you're going to use. And then it's like a dungeon down there. But anyway, um, yeah. and I, I handed her the money. Do you know what she did with it? She put it in her bra <laughs> and she played the second half of the concert with the money close to her chest. I will not ask you anything similar, don't worry. She's still around, isn't she? They actually celebrated her 90th birthday two weeks ago. There were a few concerts in her home and uh, Andrea Lucchesini played um, because she also, she, she lives in Florence and, and so that's where she taught for many years. So many of her former students were there. And, yeah, so they celebrated her 90th birthday. Yeah. But she's not teaching anymore. No, she's not teaching. She's kind of, you know, living just very privately at her place. Yes, yes. Well, she was a very private kind of a person. Yeah, I, I never, I met her very briefly a couple of times only. I never really played for her or anything. Um, but yeah, she seemed a very, very strong woman. Uh, Stephen, you were at Curtis and you studied with Aaron Rosan. Yeah. Was he your only teacher for a long time? At Curtis? Um, well, he was my main teacher for sure, and I really adored him. Um, but I also studied a bit with, um, quite, I, quite a lot actually, with Ida Kavalfian. Yeah, sure. And um, a little bit with Robert Silverstein also, who is a concert master of Boston Symphony. Right. Yeah, before he also passed away. Um, yeah, at Curtis, they have been nice, what I found a nice, philosophy that um, providing you get approval from your main teacher, you can always uh, ask to play for other people on the violin faculty or even piano faculty or whatever. So, so I really played for a lot of the other faculty members like Curtis, although Roseanne was really my biggest. Yeah. You know, Ida um, came and played in Vancouver in about 19... 78. She played with Anne Epperson and it was at the Jewish Community Center and the Jewish Community Center had not really put on classical music concerts before and 
they didn't, for example, know that a pianist needed to have a bench that, <laughs> that was adjustable. And I got a panic call from them saying, hey, the pianist is complaining about the bench in any case. So I jumped in and I started to help out. And it was actually with that concert of Ida, after the concert, we brought, my husband and I brought Ida back to our house for supper with Anne Epperson. And Ida said, you should be presenting concerts. You're a natural at it. And uh, my husband said, well, I know she should. And I said, well, where would I get the money? And my husband said, well, why didn't you let me worry about that? And before I knew what had happened, I booked myself on a trip to New York. And I went to see managers and started up the VRS. So I have a lot to thank Ida for. And then there's a young violinist who came from this part of the world. He was probably at Curtis with you, Nikki Choi. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, Nikki and Timmy. So Nikki and... Nick, Nikki and Timmy were, uh, I went to Nikki's graduation at Curtis and I've, you know, worked with, in fact, didn't Nikki enter YCA at the same year that you did and you won? I, I think we auditioned together, but I think he didn't win that year. No, no, you did. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I was there. Oh, really? Yeah. You know, it's only, well, of course, it's only taken me, what, 11 years to book you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were very impressed, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh. So, Gabrielle, you, are you living in Turin? I live in Florence now. In Florence? Yeah, yeah. Great. And you, I, are you teaching also? I teach in an academy uh, which is near Torino, actually, yeah. That's actually where I am now. I have a mint of, and uh, I, I have uh, two full days of classes tomorrow and after tomorrow. But I go there only... Uh, twice a month. And how far is it? Uh, now with the quick train is about three hours ride from Florence to Torino. Do the two of you have concerts together before you come to Vancouver? No, we're going, uh, well, maybe. We might do a playthrough in Berlin. We're going to uh, spend a few days together right uh, two weeks before or so. Great. Um, and are you, are you are you flying separately or what? We are, I think, because I'm going to fly a couple of days earlier to visit my uh, parents in California. Oh, that's great. Where are they? Near San Francisco. Oh, lucky. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, my mom is actually planning, hopefully, to come to the to come with me to Vancouver because she hasn't. Uh, that's not true. She heard me this summer, but during Corona, she hasn't uh, had much of an opportunity to hear me play. So she's excited um, that I'm playing someone near by her, in a way. Yes. It would be great if she comes. Yeah. Okay, you guys. Well, you have a great time in California. And let me know how many of you are coming and what's happening. And Gabrielle? Have a safe flight. Thank you very much. And, uh, oh, by the way, do you like Japanese food? Yeah. Because, you know, Vancouver's a, a fantastic city for Japanese food. Oh, that's great to know. We're so looking forward to your concert. Thank you. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye-bye.